Cool, yeah, so, okay, I've started uh, Stochastic Consulting with myself and another guy, Carl Scheffler. We're both machine learning uh, PhDs from Cambridge. Uh, we're doing a bunch of consulting on, uh, as, on the side. We're reaching a stage where we're interested in hiring. So the first little bit of this is just a little plug. Um, but in my other life, I am also teaching machine learning. And so my, my, my lightning talk is going to be like learning machine learning or something like silly things smart students do. So I have seen you know people come into the field being very enthusiastic, very excited. They've heard a lot of the hype. And then you give them an like some sort of data set and you say, I want you to go and build something. And in one particular assignment, so many of my students came back and they were like beaming. They were like, I got 98% accuracy. And so then you say, okay, but you do realize this was a cancer detection test and the incidence rate of cancer was only 2%. So your classifier is just saying no the whole time. Okay, and, and so that was one thing that seemed to come up surprisingly regularly when people start getting into the field is, is things like that. Uh, another exercise I gave my students was uh, a time series thing. And a lot of them came back with essentially no interesting things happening. They just noticed there was this super slow gradual trend. And when you, digged it, you dug into it, and some of them actually did that, they plotted the data, and they saw, okay, well, here's one cluster, here's another cluster, and here's another cluster. And that's weird for time series, right? You don't quite get what's going on until you dig into it, and you realize they've taken monthly data, and they've encoded it as an integer. So this is 2010-01, 2010-02, 20, 2010-12, and then we jump a whole bunch to 2011-01. And <laughs> so like a little bit of common sense here would say, well, if you're trying to model time series data, please try and sort of you know, keep it, try and find a representation that, that respects the data itself. And, you can't learn interesting things that happen over time if you're then somehow arbitrarily splitting it up. And the one last thing um, I was going to cover, I also gave my students a, an assignment in terms of uh, predicting loans, whether or not they'd be approved for a loan. And you know, some students came back and they said, Okay, this is great. I've found that 100% uh, predictive, sort of what you call it, 100% uh, predictive ability, and it's not impossible because this was looking at existing data that was, you know, made by a company. So we might have identified their model. So it's not entirely impossible, but it turned out they'd made a mistake, of course. So that's why they're featuring in this talk, and they basically included some variables that were only populated if the company had given them a loan. And so they were like, oh, well, it's missing data, but if it's present, it's really predictive of you're going to get a loan because you only get a loan if you get that data. <laughs> um, so I just want to finish up with sort of some takeaways. So when you start, you've got to try and think long and hard about how you're going to measure performance. Okay, so the 98% accuracy is probably not a good thing. You've got to really know your data, really plot it, really look at it, and then finally know your application. Like, how are you actually going to use this data? Because I think it has a whole big thing, and a whole big impact. And once you've done those things, then you can play around with all the cool, interesting deep learning models. You can try neural networks. You can try all sorts of Gaussian processes and other fun things, but try and get those three things right first. So. Thank you, and happy to be here. So we have a minute of questions, which probably equals one. So uh, are there any questions for the third? Shouldn't someone be coming up and swapping over so long? Uh, yes. A nice, easy question. I swear I didn't plant her. <laughs> So know how to measure performance, okay? Know your data and know your application. Know how your model is going to get applied. Know how it's going to get used. Yes? Yeah, so a 
a pretty good thing to do is something potentially like a Gaussian process where you can build in a periodic kernel. And so you can say, you know, and you don't necessarily even have to say it's going to be 365 days long. You can actually optimize the hyperparameters. And in the couple of data sets I've looked at it, but that periodicity pops out of being pretty close to 365. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Another round of applause. Professor Linda Haynes from uh, the Stats Department at UCT. Uh, yeah, looking forward to the talk.
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My talk is uh, co-authored by a colleague of mine, Karel van der Merbe, and then Adrian, who spoke just before tea time, and he promised you that I will show you some of his byplots. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of his byplots, though. I'm going to start with a simple scatter plot. So what we want to look at is visualizing uh, the whole deep learning process. And for visualization, scatter plots is very useful. And we can see our variables. In this case, we have two variables, concentration and time. We can see our samples. We can read off the values for samples. We can see that these samples have large time values. These samples have small time values. And we can see relationships. For instance, this funny shape that's decreasing some gap and further decrease over there. Now, normally we don't have only two variables. We have many variables. And the biplot is essentially a multivariate scatter plot. And this is an example of a biplot where we have our variables, and each variable is an axis through our data set. We have our samples. In this case, I don't show all the samples. I show the 95% inner uh, cloud of points with what I call a 95% bag, and I show the mean for each group of points. But you can show the individual samples um, as long as there's not too many so that you just have one big ink block. And we can read off values. I can read off the values for expenditure for each of these by uh, projecting onto my axis. And I can see relationships. I can see that this one is the... Uh, as the highest expenditure, this one is the smallest expenditure. I can see that there's some ordering in this direction, while there's not much ordering in the direction of education or the parents' education, etc. We have many different kinds of biplots. I'm giving a lightning talk, so I'm just naming them. Um, if you uh, want the detail of that, then it would mean a full day workshop or a full master's course like Audrey did uh, on biplots. If you want to represent the cloud of the data points, we use principal component analysis biplots. If you want to look at different groups in our data, we can use canonical variant analysis biplots which is based on Fisher's linear discriminant analysis and it assumes equal within class covariance matrices. In some cases, it's quite robust towards this assumption, but we also have uh, analysis of distance biplots, uh, which is applicable uh, more generally. Then, if we use specific uh, dissimilarity metrics, for instance, Bray-Curtis dissimilarity is used in ecology, then we get MDS or nonlinear biplots. If we add categorical data, we have generalized biplots. For compositional data, where my data add up to 100% or have proportions adding up to one, we have log ratio biplots. And for time series, longitudinal data, we combine the biplots with functional data analysis. And I'm quickly going to show you examples of these biplots. This is uh, longitudinal data where we look at pneumonia and in infants. We have uh, red is our cases, blue is the controls. So we have, again, the samples. We have the variables. The variables are indicated by numbers over here, um, but there's variable names associated with that. What one would like to see is, for instance, what variable had this case over there that uh, is quite different from the others, etc. And by having these lines, we can see how things change over time. And then I get to some uh, machine learning models uh, for, for credit analyses. These were uh, produced by Adrian. And this is where we work back after having a machine learning model and having predictions. In this case, 
we have blue or red prediction, we can see that, for instance, open credit lines have very little effect on the, uh, on the prediction, while the number of dependents and revolving credit clearly is uh, very important for the predictions. And then some of uh, my colleague's uh, models, he, um, where Adrian first does the predictions and then he uh, look at the biplots to understand the models. Here we first make the, uh, the, the biplot and then we use the biplot for predictions. And you can see K nearest neighbors, SVM, random forests. And then we can also use the alpha bags, which is this yellow area in the middle. And as this plot shows alpha on the vertical axis, alpha 0.65 would be over there somewhere and alpha 0.9 is way up there. You can see the shape changes and this changes my classification. If you want to know more about this, then I think both Adrian and Carl will be presenting at the Correspondence Analysis and Related Methods Conference early next year in Stellenbosch. And we cast the, wet on, the net on related methods quite wide. So. Um, I'm sure there will be something of interest to any one of you. Thank you. That's what you need the uh, full day workshop or the full course for. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of maths behind it, and for each of the different ones, there's a different way of finding it. Yeah. Well, the, uh, if you have um, two axes, you can have two orthogonal axes in two dimensions. You can't have five orthogonal axes in two dimensions. So it's an approximation. And there's some optimality criteria. For instance, principal component analysis biplots, it is the best two-dimensional approximation in the least square sense. So in terms of the, the actual value and the value in the plot, the least square sum, uh, yeah. And for each one, it's a different criteria, etc. Cool. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a real challenge to try and give you a blitzkrieg kind of presentation in five minutes. And I've listened to most of the sessions during the course of the day. And it is obviously a very, very, very technical uh, uh, field. And you've approached it from a practitioner's sort of perspective. And that's great. So what I'm hopefully going to try and do is approach it from from an industry perspective. Uh, me and my team, we currently manage around 35 billion rands worth of assets uh, on behalf of clients, hopefully, uh, many of your clients perhaps. Um, so this is real people's money. And this is not theoretical, it's very, 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 very real and has very real world implications. Now of course, um, I think as Professor Tim Gebby earlier mentioned, finance really, it's at the moment, there's a bit of, a, in a sense, an arms race going on, in the sense that you've got the confluence of two very, very powerful forces. The first one, of course, is technology, and on the other hand is increasing regulation. And this increasing regulation has a whole host of implications for things like, I think one of your other speakers spoke about not only ethics, but I would suppose more generally, governance. Now. As participants in the industry, managing assets on behalf of real people, we need to obviously be very mindful of these two very powerful but sometimes opposing forces, number one. Number two, you're well aware of the deluge of data that is just increasing at an exponential rate. And what AI and machine learning techniques actually helps us to do 
is to try and focus on what is ultimately important. So to focus on what matters. That's actually the key point. It's not all the fancy techniques that you're applying. It is the ability to focus on what matters. Secondly, I think uh, as one of the professors perhaps mentioned earlier, uh, there's an increasing move to kind of let the data speak for itself. However, within finance, especially when we are sitting across fiduciaries uh, who are looking after real men and women's assets, we have to be able to justify theoretically from a finance perspective why we believe we can make money on behalf of our clients. So there's got to be a financial theory to support um, our investment thesis. That's the one, th the, the, the key uh, principle. So we don't just let the data speak for itself. We have to start from some or other investment thesis, and then of course we can apply a range of techniques to try and validate that particular thesis or not. A further challenge that we have is, is that clients ultimately such as yourself, you would like to have a strategy that can make money under all conditions. But now markets are very, very dynamic. And there are a whole host of, in a sense, competing financial theories out there in the market. So what you need to do is you as industry or as the technicians, you need to apply your techniques, take into account that this is a highly dynamic ecosystem of, in a sense, competing theories and competing pools of capital that can have very real impacts upon asset prices. So what we've tried to do is our key insight, firstly, is of course that markets are dynamic, and what we want to do is we want to exploit the dynamic nature of markets on behalf of clients. And we use a range of statistical methods to do that. This is a little bit of a marketing slide. I'll pass it. But essentially all that it shows is that over the last decade, over various time periods, our strategy, uh, which is a highly quantitative investment strategy, is in the top 25% of all funds uh, in South Africa. Now, ultimately, as far as we view the world going forward, we see it ultimately as augmentation, if you will. <laughs> we see it as a partnership between machine learning techniques, AI, and of course, human insight. Where does the human insight come from? It comes from, of course, the, on the right hand side, the investment insight, the experience, the research and analysis, the identification of the particular models and, and machine learning techniques to use, the pros and the cons of each and every technique and so on. But at the same time, the technology is important in that it, it allows us to handle multiple dimensions and it removes us the um, behavioral bias. Well, that, I think I've come to the end of my time. Um, apologies if I've gone over. Uh, and thank you very much. Yes.
construction. So we, for example, use genetic algorithms in our portfolio optimization process. Um, and then we are also actively exploring using machine learning actually from uh, uh, what we call reg tech, uh, regulation technology. Systems, pre-trade, post-trade, um, real-time surveillance, and so on. Cool. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Benjamin from Cortex Logic. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so, yeah, today uh, chatting briefly about uh, deep reinforcement learning and touching on some of the, the recent work with competitive self-play and, and what, what potential applications are, are, are coming out of this field. Um, so just very quickly, this is the, the classic uh, reinforcement learning uh, cycle. So you have an agent. This agent can take uh, one of a set of actions that, which affects the environment. This environment, the, the state is fed back to the agent as well as a reward, whether, whether that um, move was good or bad. Or, um, yeah. And so the goal of, of reinforcement learning really is to, is to learn a policy that the agent should follow in order to, opt, in order to maximize its rewards. Um, so, so what action should it take given, given that, it's, that, it's, that the environment is in a certain state? So what are the current uh, sort of <coughs> academic are, are, are sort of using to, to explore new, new avenues? Is the, this is a classic a cart pole problem, which the cart needs to move backwards and forwards to to keep the ball um, balanced. And obviously, I mean, this um, those of you did uh, control theory and that, that sort of thing. This is solvable with, with those kinds of methods. Although it's also um, a great uh, test bed for for reinforcement learning. Um, then the the recent work, I think 2013 or so, was the Atari game um, publication, which they were able to, on a, on a wide range of games, um, train agents to to reach uh, like superhuman performance in all of these games. So here, the environment is the game. You could represent that as the set of pixels, which is what they often did. And the agent could move the, the, the paddle. If the right and they optimize, uh, maximize the score. <coughs> and then, even more recently, is, is the, the, the results on the game of Go, which is uh, hugely more complicated. Um, and again, they, they, they reached uh, way, way beyond uh, human performance. Um, so, the, where, where is, oh, I just want to illustrate very briefly where, where sort of self play happened um, in, in, these, in, the, in this framework. So, the, originally, the AlphaGo team, well, the DeepMind team, um, trained the policy network, which is basically. Um, Given the, uh, the state of the world, what, what moves are good and what moves are bad, so it would output a distribution over the possible moves. They trained that up using um, this uh, expert knowledge. So basically, they looked at all the games played on some online thing and, and videos of, of World Cups and stuff, and they, they trained the network up on that. And then they realized that the best data they have is actually generated by their own game. So they, they, they bootstrapped that and are able to, to train just purely from, from their, own, their own thing. And then, uh, this is a really cool environment, for those of you who enjoy playing but this code, is um, from OpenAI, the gym environment. And here they have two agents uh, playing against each other in the game, Sumo, trying to push each other off. Um, and here, even the, the very simple environment, they had quite, a, quite interesting emergent behavior, in that the agents were learned the way of like fooling each other and sidestepping and that sort of thing as opposed to just um, getting locked in a, in a sort of a scrum um, which is which is really good and then another outcome which is probably the big takeaway of, of competitive self-play is that it's a perfect curriculum and each person uh, each agent sort of builds skill up together um, there's a, a, another game uh, this is sort of like the open gates um, and uh, just a quick comment with, with the importance of learning is the reward. So it's quite hard to learn on sparse rewards or like one-shot learning and that sort of thing, but it's an active field of research. And here they actually have to give rewards for getting the agents to learn how to walk first before they could, could attempt, attempt the game. Really cool videos. You should uh, go, go and watch them. 
And then transfer of skill. So trading agents on the on a sumo game, it was able to um, remain stable when subjected to, to random forces. Um, whereas when they just trained an agent to, to walk sort of in a very simple environment with no other um, competitor um, helping it explore and learning the dynamics of, of the environment or of itself really, then it was not nearly as good. And then yeah, the main problem um, so what, if, what, what problems is it good for? Basically ones that you can simulate and run, run the rollout on. Um, and this is the most important stuff to take away if you, if you're interested in, in playing around. Thanks. So, any questions? Before he's running off. Before even, uh, this is a question for you. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Cool. You want to talk now? Sorry, you can talk now. So uh, uh, that's that's what I'm really interested in. But uh, my uh, the, the applications uh, for at least this form of of reinforcement learning is still pretty much in the in the game space. Um, a lot of these games make a lot of assumptions about what you know about the world and uh, don't really take into like the casting process. And so. Market decision process is the, the overarching um, theme of, of reinforcement learning, but these ones that I've been playing with have, have been um, much much simpler. Um, there are interesting applications. I myself haven't, haven't delved into them, and I don't think industry has really touched on it. Although um, these new results are very very compelling. For I mean, these are new results. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. We have Benjamin, he's not talking again, it's a different one. I know him as Benji though. Your full name is Benji. Yeah. Yeah. So Benji's going to talk, he's from Aerobotics. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yeah, so we're Aerobotics, an aerial data analytics company focusing on agriculture, just based in Woodstock down the road. Um, also, given that I've only got five minutes, we decided to speak a bit more about application rather than technology, but we can chat afterwards. Um, so we work in the space of remote sensing, which is essentially the art of analyzing an object of interest remotely without coming into physical contact with, with that object. In this case, it's crops, specifically trees. So we use multispectral imaging. Um, yeah, you can see the near infrared range of the spectrum, which essentially gives you an idea of the chlorophyll content of the, of the crop, much more than in the, in the visual spectra of light. Um, and it allows us to generate these maps, which show you essentially greens healthy, reds unhealthy. Um, how our so service works is using drones primarily as well as satellite data to automatically survey an area of land and extract things like crop health um, or fertilizer maps for ver variable rate fertilizer. Um, so we've built a, a number of products in this space, specifically a web application AeroView, which essentially lets a farmer log in and interact with this data to, to derive actionable decisions as well as a mobile application called Aeroview Scout, which lets the farmer walk into the field and, and action this data and actually uh, verify whether there's a problem or not and label or classify what that problem is. And here we're playing with concepts in uh, semi-supervised learning to start feeding this data back into a model to predict what specific problems uh, we're picking up. Um, so a bit on the data science that we're doing at Aerobotics. Specifically on the drones, we're using a few, a few different sensors. So there's the visible light camera, there's red edge and near infrared to pick up um, properties of the crop that you can't see visibly. These images are fed into the, the system and essentially the, the, main, the main function that we're working on is plant detection or localization, which essentially takes these images and converts them into data points, um, which we can start building our predictive analyses on. So plant localization, as, as we said, yeah, it's a non-trivial non computer vision problem. Often in an orchard, it's planted in a, a typical structure. It's quite an easy problem in a constrained environment. But in the real world, there's, there's a whole lot of um, complexities that we need to deal with. Um, so starting off about four years ago, we built applications where using our limited data science knowledge, we'd click on three trees in one direction, three trees in another direction. And using the orchard structure, it would interpolate and find the, the, the remaining trees. Using other things like Fourier approaches and, and template matchings or blob detection, and we were able to find trees to some level of accuracy with obvious uh, issues. 
We then moved on to our first machine learning approach, which was per pixel classification. Um, in this case, an unsupervised method using k-means to classify pixels as tree or not tree, and then trying to find each, each individual tree based on this binarized image. Again, we had issues with scale and, and um, different types of crops. So come convolutional neural networks. This is where we're currently standing, and almost by accident, using these older algorithms, we built a massive training set of data. And with the rise of convolutional neural networks, we're able to feed this into a network and automate this at a much more scalable uh, solution. So we've used specifically a, a, an architecture called the single shot multi-box detector. If you're familiar with it, it's a method come up with at Google, which essentially lets you, in a single pass, scan your image and identify objects of different scale. Um, obviously, the cons of this kind of thing is it's data hungry, expensive to train, and expensive to use. But the pros of that learning is amortized over time. Um, we're using some methods of online learning to consistently improve, improve these algorithms. It's accurate and robust. And we can merge widespread information across things like different crop types. Um, this is an old graph, but we've currently found about 3 million trees. Um, and that's growing. It's one of our KPIs. Um, <laughs> we're, we're also working on other applications, like actually counting the fruit on the tree itself. So through surveying the tree, Directly, we can count the fruit, um, and taking this a level higher, potentially we can start um, using our high-level data to predict fruit tree by tree and essentially build yield estimates. Um, looking forward, we're moving more into the automated problem detection, so based on this data, telling a farmer where a problem is. And like I mentioned, feeding that data back into the system, we could start doing things like specific disease or pest detection. Um, and even further into the future, more yield estimates and that kind of thing. Yeah. Firstly, I was really hoping for a demo, <laughs> and I've never had a KPI of number of trees, <laughs> but it's very interesting. To ask the question, while it's happening, is Robin Davies here? Cool. You might come down. Yeah, bring him with you. Sorry, it's a slightly tangent question, but do you manually fly your drones, or is that an automated process? No, so we've built an app to fly the drones too, um, and the far, it's actually the farm or service provider that fly. It's, all, it's automated, so you kind of tap the orchard, you want to fly it, generates a grid, and flies it. So. Do you know an ECMA is VGA? Because of VGA. No, I didn't see So yeah, I work for Principa. Um, we have um, historically been doing some very stable models for the financial services sector, um, doing some good tricks with waste of evidence and mathematical programs to build very stable models. Recently moving into more machine learning space with uh, uh, bag bagging algorithm, algorithms, etc. Um, so what, what we are probably most famous known for is the um, getting into the top 0.32% of uh, the Rugby World Cup predictions using some very basic tricks, uh, which was a great marketing campaign uh, for us. Um, the title for today is Amend the Gap Between Your Data and Your People. I'm talking very fast because I've got five minutes, so try and keep up with me. Um, so what's very interesting is on the board game side, is we're very, so it's a very human thing. It's very challenging computationally, machine learning side. Uh, it's been mentioned a few times around the smashing of Lisa Dole, poor guy, four games to one, um, with the, the game at the game Go, using the AlphaGo algorithm. So that's like pretty much chess on steroids. Um, what's very interesting, apart from the four games to one result, is the difference between the machine and 
Lee. So this is the DeepMind computer that um, Google put together, DeepMind put together. So that's 1,920 CPUs, 280 GPUs, or a megawatt of, of power versus Lee's well-trained 20-watt bulb in his head. I think it was burning quite brightly on that day. But the very interesting thing to, to remember is that Lee doesn't just play Go. Um, he can brush his teeth, he can drive a car, speak <laughs> probably five languages, uh, jump on a trampoline, probably brush his teeth and jump on the trampoline at the same time. <laughs> so it's, a, it's just incredible in terms of what we are capable as a, as a human, as a species. So onto the image recognition algorithms. Um, they've got pretty good, I think a lot of you have seen these. So um, as a... As a human, we're very good at picking out the chihuahuas from the blueberries. Some are more difficult than others. Um, and Microsoft's uh, API isn't, isn't bad, a group of brown and white dogs. But um, yeah, so, so we, we can see an image, and I mean, just your brain can process that extremely quickly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you another image, and there's a, a, a hidden image in that. Okay, so first person to recognize that, just do a uh, whoop whoop or something appropriate. Okay, so uh, your marks get set. Snake, well done. Okay, so that probably took about oh, under a second. It's not bad. So um, not many of us have seen a Gaboon Viper. Hopefully, if you have, this was a piece of glass between you and the Viper. Um, but just in terms of what our cavemen ancestors did for us, is those neural pathways are nicely bedded down for us. Um, and we can see that shape, those patterns very, very quickly. Um, I'm going to show you another image. Okay, and if you can just check in with your brain, and see how quickly you get this one. Okay, so here we go. Wow, that was amazing. All right, so that was the first one was a little bit slower. The second one was super, super quick, and that's what we're very excited about, um, and that we we're focusing on um, in terms of the Microsoft's API. So still struggling a bit, but I think in, in a couple of years' time it's going to get a lot better. Right, so um, there's another one, also you know very quick. Uh, it's not a saber tooth tiger, but it's close enough. Okay, so um, in terms of us as humans, um, we are amazing at processing visual images. So 30 milliseconds for your brain to process a single image. It gets quicker, obviously, as you saw now. Um, and spatial vision, super quick. I'm not going to go through this too much. Um, and in terms of how quickly we process images versus text, I mean, imagine how much, if you relate to how much uh, information is in a movie versus a book. Um, yeah, it's just that we, our brains can process so much more on that side. Okay, so what does this all mean in our space? So we do a lot of work for the call centers. We're dealing with deep learning machines. Um, these people are fantastic at um, picking up things very quickly. They also don't have a lot of time before the call goes through. So we've got a couple of seconds from one call to the next. But what's very cool is that we can package a lot of the machine learning insights into images that we can pass to the call center agent just before the call goes through. Um, I, don't have it, I don't have time for examples, um, but one can process those, um, those images, although the call center agents can process those images very well. Um, you can pass the machine learning insights in terms of the propensity to pay, the um, living standards measure, even though the demographic, um, and in terms of images to the call center agent, and they can very quickly pick up that image and that will help dramatically in terms of the success of the, the, the call going, going forward into the call. Cool, so yeah, just um, in terms of, you know, principally we want to try and bring the data and, and people together. We don't want to smash the call center agents with um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, we really want to help, help people in that regard. And that's a random parting shot. Thank you. <laughs>
developer at uh, Stone Street. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, so I've been asked uh, what sort of mining do we do? Uh, it's not based on a theorem. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the traditional mining industry. Uh, yeah, we're located out in some of the west, uh, far from all the mines. Uh, so we end up having to do a lot of trips out to around South Africa and Southern Africa and further away. Uh, yeah, so I just want to talk a bit about uh, one application. Uh, we essentially, on the whole, uh, do a lot of developing of sensors for the mines uh, to sort of optimize the mining process in various ways. Uh, so a lot of it is computer vision, uh, so using cameras and lasers. Uh, and then we also have a whole lot of process engineers that go and take that data and uh, work with the clients and see how to uh, improve the measurement of various things and uh, improve the, the whole uh, process. Uh, so this one uh, application I've been working on for the last while uh, with one of my colleagues over here uh, it's basically, you've got the big um, uh, the pit where all the blasting happens in you know, copper mines or platinum or some others. Uh, and then these big trucks go and uh, fetch the ore and then they dump the ore into the crushes. Now, the thing is you often get uh, very large rocks coming along uh, and ending up in those crushes. And that can cause a lot of downtime and uh, a lot of damage uh, in those crushes. So, um, to just give you a bit of a sense of scale here, um, if I'm standing up next to the truck, uh, I'm probably sort of, the, the axle is probably about over here. Um, so it's enormous. The, these ones um, can carry about 350 tons of ore. 350 tons in one load. Um, so it's enormous. Uh, it's a little bit dark here, uh, but this is an example of an image at one of the mines that we work with where this rock ended up in the crusher. Um, so each of these rings in the chain is probably, I don't know, it's, it's quite large, it's at least half a meter or something. But um, I think this, this rock is 30 tons. Um, so what uh, can happen in this case is uh, there's 12 hours of downtime, and each hour of downtime, uh, because of a huge mine, it costs about a million rands uh, to the client. Um, so you can quickly add up this cost and <laughs> So you don't want to miss any of these rocks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we start off by developing uh, quite an old school sort of approach, computer vision, looking for motion, uh, doing some text analysis, uh, using science techniques and merging them together. Essentially there's a lot of rules that we um, mix and match and find a lot of heuristics um, and they end up some, with something that works really nicely. Um, and here's an example of the segmentation region. So basically we're looking for the, the ore in the back of the truck, uh, and then as a subsequent step we go and segment the individual rocks. Um, but you can see there's a lot of dust sometimes, um, and it's hard to come up with a consistent set of rules that works at all mines and all weather conditions, uh, and we've encountered rain, dust, snow, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, so then came along deep learning, uh, and in the last sort of two years or so we've been uh, rolling this out to various projects. Uh, so here we're doing image segmentation using deep learning. So it's a uh, fully convolutional neural network, so we don't have the fully connected layers at the end. Um, so we want to keep that, that spatial information. Uh, and you can see an example here, we've done the background, <laughs> and we've highlighted the individual rocks that have been uh, segmented. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it creates a very nice um, edge around the image. Uh, and we found that unlike the other system, the old one where the more deployments you do to different sites and different conditions, where we sort of checkmated ourselves in terms of this rule set that you end up with rules that are mutually exclusive to different sites. Here, 